So, hello and welcome everyone to the third edition of our online discussion, A Feminist Exploration, The Great Replacement. My name is Andrea Petre, I'm a professor of gender studies at Central European University in Vienna. Uh, we are very proud to host this event with the support of the Henrik Böll Foundation, uh, European Union and the Gunda Werner Institute. You are attending the third event of our series, A Feminist Exploration, a monthly discussion series. We, the initiators of this series, are an, a network in the making, combining the work of feminist scholars, activists, advocates, to collectively fight against the backlash of the far right and create a strong bond of feminist solidarity all over Europe and beyond. Please note that this event will be recorded and you will be able to watch all the editions of this series online. This recorded video, just as every event of this series, will be available shortly afterwards on the YouTube channel of Henrik Böll Foundation. In our last event, Professor Livia Ola, Stockholm University, Sweden, has given us an introduction to the history of demography and how it has been framed in various ways. From an optimistic point of view, where population growth equals uh, the possibility to create more resources, and the pessimistic view that emphasizes the idea of overpopulation. This interpretation has been driven to its extreme by the far right that operates with conspiracy theory of the so-called great exchange of populations as an intentional politically orchestrated initiative. The idea has become popular, nourishing reproductive policies and demographic doom fantasies within the so-called identitarian movement. This will be the emphasis of the today's lecture. Together with Judith Goetz, literary scholar and political scientist at the University of Vienna, we will dive into the nationalization of inequalities a cornerstone of right-wing extremist thinking. The seemingly apolitical reference to nature, normal families, or demography is highly popular. In the context of gender relations, this premise openly invokes nature to legitimize racist, colonial, and classist structures. In this lecture, we will deconstruct how gender is used as a glue in this strategy, acquire an insight into the close link between anti-feminist discourses and right-wing extremism's core belief, such as to a racialized, ethnicized worldview. Questions that we will touch on are the following. How does the far right use the topic of sex, gender, and sexuality to bring racist population politics back into the political sphere without actually calling it by that name? How adaptable are anti-feminist discourses and how are they able to gradually include more and more issues in their relatively coherent master narrative of the threatened so-called natural order? This is going to be a moderated discussion. So please feel free to submit any questions you have and we will discuss them after the input. Uh, after the impact by Judith uh, Goetz, it, it, I will moderate a short discussion and um, uh, disrespectful comments will be not tolerated. Uh, and we plan to leave 20 minutes to take questions from the audience. If you have questions, please submit it through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. By now, everybody is familiar with the Zoom, so this is at the bottom right screen. So now I'm very glad to pass the microphone to Judith Goetz. Thank you very much, and we are looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Hello, and a very warm welcome also from my side. Uh, thanks for organizing this lecture and thanks for joining the lecture. This afternoon, I will briefly open my presentation and then I will start. 
Okay. The Great Replacement, Reproduction and Population Policies of the Far Right, taking the Identitarians as an example. Starting point of this lecture is a reconstruction of the key argumentation patterns the extreme right in German-speaking countries use for supporting their reproduction and population policies. I will then continue with analysis of relevant narratives taking the far right group of identitarians as an example. In particular, the campaign Stop the Great Replacement, which was initiated in 2014 by their Austrian chapter. Within the framework of a critical discourse analysis, I investigated how the identitarians have updated the key argumentation patterns of far-right reproduction and population policies, although basically they only modernized the language of decades-old ideas. And I've also looked at which role gender-specific aspects have played in this con context. I will show that right-wing extremist reproduction and population policies mainly form around the narrations of a decline in the birth rate of the autochthonous population, of an exchange of populations due to immigration, multiculturalism and Islamization, and of an aging society. To the greatest part, these lines of argumentation are mirrored within the identitarian discourses on death demographic policy. Moreover, this complex of alleged problems is closely related to far-right concepts of gender relations. The ideas presented by right-wing extremists as well as their identitarians for preventing the imagined exchange of populations show clear notions of gender roles. While men are supposed to avert the exchange of populations by being valiant and combative, women should play their part by having more children. This identitarian promotion of pronatalistic, nativist, and family-centered policies hides their fear of societal change and their desire for upholding existing orders. Right-wing extremist policies often refer to agendas of population policy, which also includes topics of reproduction policy. From an imagined great replacement and the declining birth rate to the, uh, of the autochthonous population to the aging of society, the societal discourses on demography have been shaped by the extreme right during the past decades. Their leading role was made possible by the fact that no other political camp dealt with questions of demographic developments and with promoting a higher birth rate so early and so intensively. This does not seem surprising as this approach brings numerous advantages for the far right. Using demographic development as their key point, they were not only able to address topics of social, family, women's and reproduction policy, but also to link these with questions of migration on the one hand and with gender relations on the other. The narrative of demographic change, which is still present until today, opened up opportunities for the far right to modernize racist discourses and to establish their topics in mainstream media and thus the so-called center of society. To deal with demographic discourse in the extreme right, thus seems to be important, especially because it is one of those politically ideological overlaps between the center and the extreme right, which will probably gain in importance in the years to come as Christoph Butterwege already stressed in 2002. Regarding the increased reference to population policy in Germany after the reunification, Susanne Schulz also states that an increased significance of discourse on the demographic crisis. Diana Hummel and Eva Balusius coined the term demographization for the tendency to discuss social problems and conflicts as originating from demographic developments. The usefulness of this current revival of demography was also recognized by the so-called identitarians, a right-wing extremist group which had been active in the German-speaking countries since 2012. In 2014, its Austrian chapter initiated a campaign that made the, uh, the fight against the Great Replacement 
its central point for several years. Against the backdrop of a key fear mongering scenarios of doom, degeneration and decay, which have occupied the extreme right since forever, the far right activists tried to amalgamate different enemies from Islam to feminism, equal opportunities, gender theories, LGBT rights to the EU and left wing policy in general. Within the framework narrative of the exchange of population and to reinterpret them as demographically caused to suit their intentions. With regard to demographic change or the demographic apocalypse conjured up by the far right, three issues play an important role in right-wing extremist discourses. Firstly, the decline of, in the birth rate of the autonomous population. Secondly, the exchange of populations due to immigration, multiculturalism and Islamization. And thirdly, the aging of society. According to right-wing extremist ideas, the first problem is caused by feminism and women's emancipation, gender theories and LGBT rights. By allegedly fueling, fueling professional ambition and anti-family attitudes, these are said to promote childlessness. Other factors referred to are legal access to abortion, in some cases even birth control in general, and of course a sex education of diversity. However, right-wing extremists do not propagate a general pro-natalistic policy, but wish to control which children should or will be born. After all, the reproduction of the poor and of immigrants should well be curtailed in their view. Thus, and as also Livia stated in her lecture last time, the alleged lack of children of the autochthonous population is lamented, whereas the large size of immigrant families is criticized. There are even warnings of a population explosion, especially in the South. This pattern of thought makes visible the connection with the second problem area. It is based on a number of openly and less openly racist mental figures and follows the logic that the autochthonous people will be replaced through immigration, finally even leading to a state where they become a minority within their own country. As those immigrants are supposed to be Muslims to the greatest part, the conspiracy narrative continues that they would be trying to Islamize Europe's, Europe by means of targeted immigration. In another narrative, the people is presented as a unique species needing to be preserved or as an organism that needs to be kept clean, that cannot take too many foreign influences and that is put in mortal danger by amalgamation. This transfer of an evolutionary mechanism from the animal and plant kingdom to human society is a proof of naturalization of the social. The aging of society in turn is interpreted by right-wing thinking as the absence of young virile men, which is said to contribute to the weakening of the people by undermining its defensive potential and its ability to compete in general, but also in economic terms. I will now move on to the gender aspects of right-wing extremist population and reproduction policies. Summing up, it can be stated that right-wing extremists imagine the people being threatening, threatened from within and from the outside. The process of decomposition being caused by too little birth on the one hand and by foreign infiltration on the other. This threat scenario makes it possible, among other things, to declare feminism and Islamization as an enemy of the people and to imply a common interest and a common strategic approach. The continuous criticism of current demographic policies of the far right seems to have furthered the connection between discourses of anti-feminism and population policy. The anti-gender discourse in particular provides right-wing extremist activists with a narrative which allows them to articulate racist ideas in a way that is acceptable way beyond the circles of the far right. 
The presented problems and their reasons, as determined by the far right, are closely intervened with right-wing extremist notions of gender relations. The pro-natalist, nativist, and feminist policy that is proposed as a solution for the declining birth rate means for women in particular, among other things, limitations of the right of self-determination of their bodies, an increased dependency of the family breadwinner, and the renaturalization of the social, which fundamentally tries to force women back into traditional gender roles. The ideas presented by right-wing extremists for preventing, preventing the imagined exchange of population, for this reason also shows clear visions of gender roles. Recent uh, publications on the topic of the identitarians hardly touch the field of reproduction and population policy. An analysis of the identitarians' political agenda quickly reveals the dominance of two political fields, discourses around migration and around population policy, typically in combination. Thus, the described demographization of social problems and conflicts described above can be observed also in identitarian statements. The narratives of the extreme right described above, declining birth rate, exchange of population, aging societies, are used by the identitarians as well, especially in their campaign against the Great Replacement, which was initiated in 2014 and was able to disse disseminate this narrative of conspiracy. Where the extreme right in the past talked about Volkstod, death of the people, or Umvolkung, ethnicity inversion, this has been replaced by the synonym of great replacement during the past few years. The term goes back to Renaud Camus, a French writer of the extreme right. From the beginning, it served as a strategic alternative to those older politically tainted concepts. In accordance with the meta-political approach of the identitarians, it was also meant to give a new meaning to key discourses, thus changing and updating the hegemonic and therefore dominant interpretation and embedding them to, uh, on the long run firmly within social awareness. The identitarian core narratives are more or less identical with the discourses described and illustrate the demographization of social problems. Along this line, the identitarians see the great replacement as a demographic process resulting from a combination of mass immigration and the low birth rate among the native population. In Flux, their leader, Martin Selner, elaborates on his conspiracy myth of a planned exchange, which allegedly wants to change a monoethnic population into a multicultural one, being forced, I quote, up the, uh, upon the European people by supranatural elites, I quote ends. Within this campaign, the identitarians also referred to the declining birth rate, I quote, Due to the declining birth rate among Austrians, the native population continues to shrink year after year, and yet the total population keeps growing. Quote ends. The identitarian demands are mostly identical with those raised by the extreme right so far. I quote, we demand a children and family friendly policy, so our people will still exist in the future. Quote ends. Using slogans like Heimatschutz is Lebensschutz, pro-life is pro-homeland, which are well known in far-right extremist circles, the German identitarians also condemn abortion as it allegedly contributes to releasing the individual from their responsibilities and thus, I quote, degrading children to disposable products, to interchangeable commodities like old sand for cell phones or empty coffee cups, quote ends. Additionally, the number of births and abortions are offset against another and associated with the change in population. Quote, demographic change and infiltration are thus the homegrown evil of an unmanly and decadent society, quote ends. 
finally, also the discourse around the aging of society found its way in the political statements of the identitarians. In an article in the right-wing magazine, Secession, Martin Selner, the already mentioned leader, writes about an aging society which also creates a lame and weakened youth, directly alluding to the idea of the lack of combativeness. The construction of these doomsday scenarios always contains an appeal to men and women alike to become active and to take part in the identitarian savior fantasies. According to identitarian rhetoric, this means for men to become valiant again and to take on supposedly natural masculine tasks like protecting the fatherland, the people and the women from the invoked threats. The valiant competitiveness of man is said was to be destroyed mostly by the generation of 68, who, I quote, took away masculinity from men, educating them to become weakling, cuddling bears without any energy and drive, without any courage to be strong, in, the wor in one word, without any will to power, quote ends. Women as well play a central role on several levels of the great replacement narrative. Firstly, as victims, secondly, as culprits, and thirdly, as mothers. On the first level, women are presented as the main victims of the Great Replacement. On the one hand, it is said men defined as foreigners intend to curtail their rights. On the other hand, autochthonous women are threatened by sexualized violence by exactly these men. This approach was used, for example, in their campaign 120 decibel, which was initiated by identitarian women in 2018 in order to create an identitarian or right-wing extremist Me Too. In a video published on YouTube, several female identitarian activists made reference to recent violent crimes against women and stated that they felt continuously threatened by men defined as foreigners this being the reason why they always had to carry a 120 decibel pocket alarm with them. Subsequently, they asked, with little success, other women to post under the hashtag their experiences with sexual violence perpetrated by allegedly foreign men. In the second strand of identitarian discourse, women are assigned responsibility for the great replacement. As women vote significantly more often than men for liberal or left-wing parties, they are portrayed as enablers of the great replacement through liberal immigration laws and refugee-friendly policies. Following this misogynist logic, women not only play a, a crucial role in enabling the great replacement, but they always also have to blame themselves for, cutting, for the cutting back of their rights and for the sexualized threat by perpetrators defined as foreigners. The third discourse strand takes up the pronatalist impulses among the identitarians and centers around the notion that women could prevent the great replacement by having children. Continuing the month for our children, children and, and family-friendly policy, the accomplishments of mothers should be recognized as they guaranteed that our people will still exist in the future, say the identitarians. This shows how the identitarians and their perceptions are modeled in a deeply biologistic way as dichotomous and complementary archetypes they refer to women mainly in terms of motherhood and reduce their role in preventing the imagined exchange of populations, most importantly to their child breeding, bearing potential. To conclude, it can be said that right-wing extremists imagine a decomposition of the people from within due to a low birth rate and from the outside by means of infiltration. Ultimately, as Schulz points out, current discourses on demographic policy center around questions of 
how the body of the national people should be composed in the long run and which nationals we will need in the future. Thus, it is possible to derive right-wing extremist solutions from these problem complexes of social, family and population policy, whose primary objective is the biological reproduction of the people and whose corresponding discourses of demographization can open up spaces of political resonance. This includes, among other things, demands for a promotion of a child-friendly, pronatalist policy for a privileged status of the heterosexual nuclear family or for a strengthening of national sentiment in order to increase the people that it, people's dedication to its own preservation and to further their commitment against egalitarianism and multiculturalism as these allegedly means mean a leveling down. The ideas presented by far-ranking extremists like the identitarians for preventing imagine, the imagined exchange of populations also show clear visions of gender roles. While men are supposed to avert the exchange of populations by means of valiant competitiveness, women should play their part by having more children. At the same time, men and women alike are called upon to stop ideologies like feminism, multiculturalism, liberalism, and egalitarianism from wielding their alleged destructive power. The identitarian promotion of pronatalist, nativist, and family-centered policies also hides their fear of change and underlines their desire for upholding existing orders, which find their expression in a racist mania of homogeneity and the biologistic gender concepts. This way, they want to be saved from the impertinent demands which could be created by pluralization and a lack of disambiguity. As their policy leaves no room for differences or plurality, there is a fundamental conflict with egalitarian and democratic concepts of the society. And that's the reason why we should deal with it. Yeah. That's my presentation, and um, yeah, I'm ending here and hope that I gave you a good input and overview over the um, identitarian reproduction and population policies. And I'm now open for your questions. Thank you very much, Judith, for this wonderful um, and uh, uh, insightful talk. And uh, uh, let me start with the first question uh, till the uh, audience um, will um, uh, come in with, uh, 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 no, we have already have a question uh, from Joan. I have a question. What strategies would you suggest to counter these right-wing strategies? Immediately you got the $1 million question, right? <laughs> so what would be your suggestion to counteract these um, this, uh, strategies? Well, I would say as a political scientist, my job, of course, is to analyze the narrative uh, strategies of the far right and to have a look at their political propaganda and to transfer my knowledge in an understandable way to the people and to encounter the fears and threats that I spread among the population. and. Um, and also to um, work closely together with people who do educational work in order to, you know, right-wing extremist prevention works on three levels. So um, on the one hand, we have work with people who already got criminal, who are in prison, who are already, I don't know, um, did some actions, uh, violence, etc. And the big problem of uh, right-wing extremist prevention work is that uh, a lot of them um, focuses on exactly this work. But it's very hard to change one's mind if you're ideologically already that um, 
involved in right-wing extremist scenes. So my suggestion would be to focus more on people who are only sympathizers with right-wing extremist ideologies, but who are not uh, that involved. And so it would be more important to do educational work with exactly these people and to talk with them and not their leaders and those who always hold the lectures and who speak up, but those who are um, personal and political views are not closed yet, who are still open for discussion, who are still open for arguments. But I think the most important thing would be to work, um, especially with children and young people who are not yet sympathizers of right-wing extremist ideas or right-wing far-right ideas in general. So if it was for me, I would say that we would have to do a lot more educational work in elementary schooling and also in high school in order to work um, especially with the youngsters in this critical uh, stage of puberty of adolescence where um, young people are trying out and um, um, developing their own identity and for some youngsters it's very difficult this um, this process of becoming an individual and some encounter these um, fears that raise during this phase by um, very strict and hierarchical worldviews like their extreme right offers. And if we help them to learn to get along with contradiction, to get along with a very complex society, um, I think this would be very helpful. But I also think it's important to work with elderly people because when we look at election results, we see that the group of the over 60 years old people also tend to vote um, for right-wing extremist parties um, in a very high percentage. And there's hardly any educational or social work with elderly people. So I think this is also something we should focus on and keep in mind that it would be very important, especially if old people are kind of isolated and don't have so much contact anymore with people who argue with them and um, who discuss certain uh, social problems with them so that they don't fanaticize them. So this was a very long answer, but I hope it helped uh, a bit. Thank you. I think that's really the, the, the key question, right? So, and, uh, and I would like to ask a question uh, as a follow-up. Uh, Ines Kappert asking the question that in, what, uh, in which way the so-called middle of society adopted the ideologies of the big replacement. Uh, because in your talk, you were talking about, you know, this uh, big replacement theory as a very useful strategy of the identitarians to be to become mainstream. But if you are, if we are walking on the streets of Vienna now, the FPÖ posters are very much, uh, you know, following this type of visual uh, narrative and discourse about the uh, replacement. So uh, uh, in what that's, uh, that's the question what Ines is asking, in which way the so-called middle of the society adopted ideologies of the uh, big replacement. Mm. Just an, as an explanation, um, Vienna has uh, community elections uh, mid of October. That's why all parties are campaigning at the moment. And of course, the uh, Austrian Freedom Party, the FPÖ, has a very uh, racist uh, um, election campaign. Um, and at their posters, you see women in burkas uh, as a threat. And uh, on the other hand, there's an image of the principal candidate and uh, with uh, white uh, people and the policeman uh, securing safety for the own people. And of course, this narration of an exchange of the population is very old. This is, was not invented by the identitarians. Actually, it's also very strongly used in the neo-Nazi scene, but uh, with other terms. And the, um, the uh, greatest um, achievement of the identitarians was to popularize this uh, myth among the um, center of society by using terms that are not so tainted and that don't, uh, that, that don't seem so dangerous. And um, so the great uh, replacement in the beginning was um, very 
a very pop uh, or it was very easy for them to to spread this narrative and i think um their strategy was uh, very successful also because they uh, do these spectacular actions where they try to popularize their political messages and throw um, from um, time to time more and more newspapers use the term, spread the term. And so um, it resulted that now politicians that are not close to the identitarians use this term and that also mainstream media uses the terms, journalists use the term and so on. So this was their successful strategy. And um, as far as the center of society is concerned, of course, this goes along with this permanent narrative of there's so many foreigners coming and um, there's also, you know, when you hear people talking in the metro stations and in the underground, when they say, well, you hardly hear any German word. So they see everything as a proof of this conspiracy myth, even though when you look at statistics, um, this um, might not be um, proof that there's an actually exchange going on. And of course, I mean, um, we live in a, a, a migration society and uh, the whole world um, is, uh, has been, um, uh, people all over the world migrated for decades and centuries. So of course we all live in a, in a society that has faced migration for a long time. And, um, but I think that the main thing about popularizing this uh, myth is um, that, that it's so successful um, in, in um, brought through the mainstream media into discourses of the center of the society. Okay, uh, so this is about uh, about these conspiracy theories. Agnieszka Graf is asking a question. Can you say more about the conspiratory aspects of this theory? Who is said to be behind the great replacement? Some of the wordings you uh, cite suggest Jews or global elite. I would appreciate that quote again. Mm. Yeah, the identitarians, of course, uh, also have a lot of um, hidden anti-Semitism in uh, their political propaganda. And so as a lot of other right-wing extremist group, they see global elites behind these processes of migration. And they, among others, name George Soros, who, um, whom they think is uh, a very influential person in organizing this um, uh, population exchange. Um, and so they also imagine that there are some hig hidden figures um, in, in the back rooms of the power who are uh, organizing this whole replacement to weaken the autochthonous population. And, um, but all in all, this conspiracy myth works with a lot of different narratives. So on the one hand, it's this uh, structurally anti-Semitic narrative with the Jews or the powerful globalist elites in the background. On the other hand, it's also the feminists who weakened um, the masculine gender roles so that men are not able to defend themselves anymore. And uh, it's also the Muslims who try to destroy the, the people from inside. So it's basically, as I mentioned, um, the, the feminists, the Muslims or the Islamization and the Jews in, in the background. And um, I know that in the past, uh, often the use conspiracy theory, theory has been used. I would not support this term because it kind of, um, yeah, supports the image that is an actually scientifically proved theory. So that's why I would rather prefer the term uh, myth or narrative because, um, yeah, it's, it's not the real theory, it's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the uh, question of uh, how to fight this, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so let's see who can be the allies. And here, Mika Ferlo was asking the question after, of course, uh, thanking you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, could you say something about whether these identitarians reach out to women that are attracted to or part of a strand of feminism that can be called maternal feminism? Are all feminists bad, evil for them? 
Well, I, I, I closely looked at uh, identitarians references to feminism and I found three different uh, patterns of argumentation. One is that feminism is the cause of all evil of modernization and um, a liberal society. So feminism as a great enemy. Then I also found attempts to look for something like a uh, folkish feminism, um, namely by uh, referring to uh, women, uh, historical women also, who try to argue that men and women are equal but have different uh, roles in society and who also strongly argue with biologistic arguments like that women are very linked to nature and that women are so social and because they're of their ability to bear children, they are more linked to nature and stuff like that. And the, sec uh, the third narrative, which I find the most important one at the moment is to uh, present anti-feminism as the real um, fight for women's rights. And they do this by several discursive tricks, I would say. One trick is, um, for example, that uh, they argue that the fight for women's right was legitimate, uh, legitimate in the past, namely that it was good that women uh, got the right to vote and access to university. But this was all in the past. And now we live in a society where women and men are treated equally and there's no discrimination of women or no gender discrimination. And um, the and this opens up two following arguments. On the one hand, um, they can um, argue against feminists and say, well, that what, fe what feminists do at the moment, it's all luxury prob uh, problems. Uh, they never get enough. They always want to spread um, fights amongst the genders. They uh, want to forbid us to be man and woman and they want, they always have these strict uh, language regulations and so on. And at the same time, they present themselves as the real defenders of women's rights because their um, second argument is we live in this society where everything is fine and men and women are treated equally. But now the migrants that are coming to Europe, the, they are re-importing patriarchy. And uh, so they are endangering women's rights. And since uh, feminists are so liberal and refugee friendly, and also the leftist parties are so liberal and refugee friendly, the right-wing parties and the right-wing organizations are the only ones who stand up for women's rights and defend women's rights against migrants and the imported, so-called imported patriarchy by um, uh, uh, migrant men. Thank you. There is another aspect of this uh, fighting against this kind of ideas, and that is uh, the second question Ines Kappert was uh, asking. How is uh, the European Union currently dealing with it, having a commissioner for democracy? So uh, do you have a response on this, that uh, how the European Union currently dealing with this kind of uh, discourses of the so-called great replacement? Well, I don't, I'm not an expert on the European Union, so I can't answer this question in particular, but I think um, uh, since uh, a lot of the uh, recent uh, right-wing terrorist attacks also use this conspiracy myth as legit uh, legitimization of um, uh, of their attacks, I think um, some people at least opened up their mind a bit that this is a very, very dangerous conspiracy myth. For example, uh, you know, the um, perpetrators of the uh, right-wing terrorist attack in Christchurch uh, named his manifesto after the same uh, slogan, namely the Great Replacement, and also the uh, perpetrators in Halle, in Hanau, in uh, El Paso, they always referred to the same narrative. And I think so for this reason, there's more discourse going on about um, 
uh, how dangerous this uh, narrative actually is and that you know the um, propaganda of words can actually lead to attacks and the killing of people in the name of the combat against the great replacement mm -hmm. Thank you. This uh, uh, element of transnational connections. We have a question from Kata Balint about what are the similarities and differences between the great replacement narratives of the Central Eastern European countries, where you practically do not have any uh, refugees or, or migrants. Mm. Um, I'm also not an expert on uh, Eastern and uh, Southern European countries, but I know that there are identitarian groups also in uh, Slovakia, in Poland, in Hungary, in Czech Republic, in Slovenia. And as far as I followed them, I saw that they also took over this uh, campaign and that they supported this campaign and that they used the um, main arguments that the identitarians in Germany and Austria are using. So at least there is this influence um, of, of the identitarians, uh, the German speaking identitarians also in these countries present through the political propaganda. And I mean that um, the fact that, that there's a little migration in certain countries um, was never led to the fact that people would be less uh, racist or less uh, willing to believe in racist conspiracy myths because um, as we already also know from, from research, sometimes there's even more racism in areas where little foreigners actually or little, uh, little migrants actually uh, live. So I think this um, doesn't automatically need to have um, uh, um, uh, um, work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that, uh, uh, let me just add uh, a, a tiny point that uh, uh, the recent research about the East Central European countries shows that uh, in the past 10 years, uh, from a very pro-migrant, uh, pro-refugee uh, sentiment, uh, some of the countries shifted radically to the other direction. So by now, for example, Hungary became one of the most xenophobic societies. And uh, in that, actually mainstreaming some of the ideas, what uh, uh, you presented as the identitarian um, uh, idea, uh, uh, ideas played a crucial role. Uh, we have, uh, so how did it happen? So we have Karin Liebhardt's uh, uh, question about the role of women in these movements. So the feminist activist in the generation identity and uh, what is their role in the movement compared mm. to the role of the male activists? Well, um, in, in all identitarian groups, the principal leading figures have always been men. For example, in Austria, there were local groups in seven of nine counties of Austria, and all leaders um, used to be men. Nevertheless, there's a, a great presence of women there as well. I would say that in, in the highest time of activists, it was about um, twenty percent of the activists that were women, and um, th for those women, of course, it was also a way of express uh, political, uh, become po politically active, to express political opinions, and so on. But at the same time we could also see that there was an instrumentalization going on of these women, for example, at demonstrations where they were put in the first rows of the, of the marches in order to create an, an image of the demonstration that seemed uh, less militant, less violent, more um, a, a bit harmless in a way. And especially you could see this in the march in Berlin three years ago, where um, there's been a blockade, so the identitarians could not march. And at the beginning of the demonstration, the first rows, it was mainly women. But then when the um, identitarians wanted to, um, were not willing to accept that they could not march and wanted to kind of fight with the police, they told all the women to go into the middle of the demonstration so the men could kind of, um, yeah, march in front and, um, yeah, encounter the police. 
And um, we also know from a woman that recently left the identitarian movement that even the campaigns that were started by the women within, I, I would not say movement because the identitarians um, have never grown that big that they were actually a movement. So this is a kind of self, self um, presentation to make them bigger than they actually are to call themselves a movement. So I would rather speak of the group. And um, uh, a woman that left the group and um, who had been very involved in this uh, 120 decibel campaign that I also mentioned, who uh, criticized after leaving the group, the sexism in the group. And she, um, in an interview, also stated that every, uh, every decision was taken by men and that they would never um, let the women decide independently. And that was also why she left the movement. She's still active in other racist structures and she's still a uh, racist, but she left the, the group and, um, you can also see a lot of in attempts to, to form subgroups of um, the identitarians. For example, there was a project uh, called Radical Feminin, organized by two women. They had a homepage and, the, and also these uh, video blogs where they talked about um, current political issues. And then the 120 decibel campaign, then there was an own Twitter account and on uh, a Facebook account. Um, I mean, from Facebook, they got um, deleted by deplatforming, but from Twitter and uh, they deleted the, the account themselves after this fight uh, when this one activist left. And also the other campaigns like 200, uh, 120 decibel and uh, radical feminine did not have much success. So within a year or a bit longer, they all vanished from the internet again and um, yeah we're no no real success mm -hmm. thank you uh, a, a question about the uh, organization uh, Asha Ekwal uh, these right-wing groups seem very well organized in many countries intimidating and threatening women's rights activists for instance they also seem to have money do we know anything about how they learn to organize and how they are funded the foundation thing is actually very, very difficult. I am, we, we just have speculations. For example, in Germany, there is this 1% uh, NGO and it's very likely, for example, that they get money from there. Um, it's also very likely that the um, members of the identitarians pay a kind of membership fee to be in this group and that they have some uh, sponsors. Um, because you know, um, when we see pictures of the identitarians, it's mainly young people in their 20s or early 30s. But of course, when they organize um, their meetings in some uh, antique restaurants and stuff, there's uh, not only these young people, but there's also um, older um, men there who uh, probably have already uh, finished uh, their studies and have influential jobs who are also willing to donate money to um, the group. So this, uh, and of course, they also had a lot of crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes um, journalists um, also supported them in their crowdfunding by reporting about their uh, campaigns. I think the, um, the worst case was when they had this, uh, this um, campaign where they uh, had this ship in the Mediterranean trying to stop NGOs from uh, rescuing refugees, where almost all newspapers all over the world had in their headlines that the identitarians were looking for money to fund this campaign. And about the structure, um, it's a hierarchical structure, of course, so, uh, and they also um, sometimes use military terms for it. So you have these leading figures that, uh, of course, have a lot more influence. And um, then you have these uh, county leaders and sometimes uh, even in smaller community leaders that are mainly men. And I think you have to be an activist for some time to um, kind of make a career within the group and to take over more important positions. But um, mm 
yeah. Thank you. The last question. Uh, I think this is a good summary question from Lisa Smith. Uh, uh, do you have any comments on why gender is so often a central platform for right-wing extremism? Yeah, I would say um, it's a, a, a very strategic approach by the, or it's not only a strategic approach. On one hand, of course, it's very important in the ideology for uh, reproduc uh, reproduction of the people and uh, reproduction of uh, the kind of homogeneous society they want to live in. But on the other hand, I think this, um, as Andrea said also in the introduction, this uh, fear of gender, gender theories um, also functions as a glue that unites uh, very different actors um, or that functions as a bridge between different political spectrums. And um, this also has to do with the fact that this um, image of uh, biologistic uh, gender roles are so deeply rooted in society and so normal to many people that it's uh, when, when the uh, right-wing extremist um, groups or politicians um, try or, or uh, speak about gender, they can refer to something that is very common in, in the everyday life, uh, lives of a lot of people. And so this also helps them to get out of this right-wing extremist notion by referring to, well, we all want to be the gender that we're born with and we have these natural roles and women and men are different and they have different roles in society. This, uh, this um, thoughts are so deeply rooted in society that it's not a right-wing extremist thinking per se, but it's mainstream. And this helps them also to, to enter mainstream and present themselves as the def defender of mainstream thoughts and um, yeah, mainstream ideas. And I, I think that's so, that's the, the big advantage for, for right-wing extremists. And also that with this anti-gender discourse, it's also, and, and especially the demographic discourses, it's so easy for them to include racist ideas by not calling it by their names. So they're not anymore um, arguing for um, a homogeneous population but um, they're arguing, as I mentioned, uh, against um, the exchange of populations or um, the decline of birth rates and so on. But um, this is basically the same racist ideology. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Judith. And uh, I have to apologize for several colleagues and uh, participants whose questions we did not have the time to respond. But uh, uh, the so many questions actually prove that this kind of discussion and this kind of topic is so timely and so interesting. So thank you again, Judith, for your uh, uh, participation and your really important uh, input. And uh, uh, let's close here. The recording will be available on the Bell Foundation um, website and please watch out for future events for the feminist platform. So thank you and have a nice evening or afternoon or morning wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.